Where's the 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 Where's the
We're, we're repairing the plane, we're building the plane, we're fixing the plane while it's out flying and everyone's in there. And in corporations, you know, I consciously chose to be an entrepreneur in a company that was kind of small because I couldn't stand that stuff. But what I was seeing in all these companies then I learned, it's like no one wants to hear this story because everyone's just concerned about where's the blame going, not how do we keep the company safe. It's like, I'm just not going to go down with this shit. That's kind of tough. <clears throat> so, no, I couldn't, I, I realized, how am I going to make people care about this other than it's just a sordid soap opera of the story? Because that's not what I wanted to do. Um, and then, really, there's nothing I can do about that until the, the courts overturn the Federal Trade Commission. The, the, uh, the FTC overturned their judge. So, we, so you go through the FTC, as most, some of you know, and, and they have their own judges. And their judges don't go by the rules of civil procedure, and they don't go by um, uh, the rules of evidence. They have their own rules. So your lawyers that come in, they're used to the real world of judicial, or, or like in you know, Alice in Wonderland. And so the judges are below the commissioners. And you go through this hearing and all this procedure for three years, and after that's all done, the commissioners just overrule them. 100% of the time, last 20 years. So, but what they said, everyone's opinion is, under the FTC Act, vulnerable exposed data is now considered to be an unfair business practice. So if you have any data that's vulnerable exposed, and you know that definition they can make up like whatever, then you could be breaking the law. So it's just a lottery of not getting caught, because if you get in their web, you're dead. And then um, they determine it can rule a company security practice where unreasonable or likely to harm, even without tangible harm. So my loaded gun could make me, you know, guilty of murder because someone could have gotten hurt. Or you can't prove someone got hurt, but so this this kind of freaked everyone out. Now suddenly everyone's like, oh my gosh, if Lab MD loses, we're just in a hell of a, like a hell of a time. No kidding. Okay, so what happened to Lab MD, right? So I'll try to go through this pretty quick for those who've heard this before, but um, 2008 to 9, we were quote unquote hacked. We didn't know it was a hack at the time. We had someone call and say they had our stuff, and they found out in the cyberspace. So we were never told it was taken from our workstation. FTC investigation 2014 to 15, the, um, I'm sorry, it's 2010 to 13, sorry. 2014 and 15, we have the administrative trial or hearing in the FTC, and Congress starts to investigate. This is where it starts getting really crazy, right? In 1617, the FTC overturns, we end up in the U.S. Court of Appeals. And then at Lab MD 1, if you call it that, destroyed, gone, but now vindicated uh, in 2018. So now we're in the rearview mirror of like, what, what the heck happened? And this was me at the beginning, stupid, naive, and thinking, oh, of course, justice is going to win out. This will be brief and cheap. <laughs> Because we didn't do anything, and we're just diagnosing cancer, and we're all really nice people. We mean nothing wrong, so why would anyone attack us? <laughs> so I guess you can see babies are really dumb. And uh, but what we find out is that um, one person is using LimeWire on a workstation, and one of our billing things gets out, and it, it's it's insane how much work and sideshow went into that. And after, and this is when Ty Versa calls us up and says, Hi, I'm Robert Baubeck. I'm the CEO and founder of Ty Versa. We do remediation and cyber criminal investigation. And we found one of your files out in cyberspace. And, you know, we do, we, we, we can fix that if you'd like. And, when, and I, my first question is, what's the IP address? And the immediate response is, oh, I don't know, that's going to result in a, in a services contract. So the point of that is, and, and I repeat this because I know people have heard this before, but it, it, it usually takes about seven times for it to marinate in people's brains, especially uh, mine. I mean, I know it's, there's so many branches flying off this tree, it's hard to follow sometimes. But that two-year period is really just the big extortion attempt, and all we wanted to do was make them go away. So I wouldn't hire him, but I also didn't turn him over to the authorities. You know, we called the police once, and they're like, well, we don't have any jurisdiction over that. They know what to do. Um, now they tell you they don't know what to do, or they tell you they don't have jurisdiction. Back then, they're just like, mm. And um, so, so that time, they finally went away, and after they threatened us to go to the government and, you know, try
tried to guilt trip us like crazy and sent us all this media that, that they were involved in about other people that had been gone through this, including Supreme Court Justice Breyer and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, and were furious that we would just not take the bait and hire them. But I just thought the guy was a crook because in medicine you don't you don't call up medical facilities and, and say, I got your stuff, but I but I not going to help you unless you pay me, unless you're not a good guy. That just doesn't roll. Even if you're a competing laboratory, we don't undermine each other because the patient's number one. And that's why medicine's so different. Um, all right, so just when we think the coast is clear, the Federal Trade Commission calls us up and says they're starting a non-public investigation. More, more cute little terms I didn't know what they meant and I learned later. And then a few weeks after that, this goes out. And in the press, and this is how the FTC operates. This is how government, you know how they say they never make comments before a case, but they comment before, um, I mean they don't make comments during a case, but they make comments before the case because the media just, because of who they are and they're in the US government, the media will be their free PR firm and, and put this carefully worded stuff out. And there will be no rear view mirrors. So we have widespread data breaches uncovered by FTC Pro. Years later, we find out there were no breaches, and it really was an FTC Pro, but that's beside the point. So, so the FTC warns of improper release of sense of consumer data on P2P file sharing networks. The Federal Trade Commission has notified almost 100 organizations that personal information, including sensitive data about customers and their employees, has been shared from the organization's computer networks and is available on peer-to-peer -peer file sharing networks. This is wordsmithing to the nth degree, but you can't know that if you don't know anything about technology. And how many people really know something about technology? So it works. So everybody thinks, oh, there, there, there the government goes, helping us all, thank you. <clears throat> but I'm trying to figure out who the FTC is. They've never been at a medical meeting or a licensing meeting or anything in my life. I've been in medicine for 30 years in surgery and cancer diagnostics. And so I find that Section 5 is, they get their job is to protect consumers from unfairness or deception. And this was built up in 1914. So they, be, uh, they say a practice is unfair if it causes or is likely to cause substantial injury to consumers, cannot be reasonably avoided by consumers, and is not outweighed by countervailing benefits to consumers or competition. Now that looks like English, that's lawyer. It's a different language, it sounds the same. And so you have to be careful because causes or is likely to cause substantial, cannot be reasonably avoided, is not outweighed by countervailing benefits, and they're not the decider and the definition changes like you know, moving back. So if you're, if you're one of the few people on the receiving end of being regulated by this, this isn't funny. And um, this has been made up 100 years ago. So when technology started, it was a battle in DC of like, oh, who's gonna get to regulate data? That's so juicy. And the FTC decided this was gonna be the broadest one because Congress was making no laws. So we have to live with this. So why isn't Congress making laws? This is my quick little history 101. My, my pure opinion about this, and I don't think I'm wrong, is that this whole thing started 100 years ago when Woodrow Wilson decided, well-intentioned, that you're going to have politicians regulate industry and science, and that's a recipe for disaster. So he wanted to, he built this administrative state part, this, these agencies that were supposed to be just experts in those fields. That didn't last long. Well, and so because we have these four branches of, three branches of government, two of them are split in two, and they're all separated in power, okay? And sometimes that doesn't work really well when you have the reality of science. So we create this government agency administrative process, which is now massive, and they don't have separation of powers. They have this, the judges and the lawyers and the rule makers are all under the same roof. And we're just supposed to trust them. So the hand becomes the fist because there's really no separation of powers. And when you get snared in them, like when the FTC contacted us and started the investigation, by law, judges and Congress and no other branch of the government could stop what they were doing until they were done. That means we're all banging that they're really nice, honest people. And, then, and, how they, and they don't get real nice and honest if you don't do exactly what they want. And so we go up to D.C. and we're just hoping people go away. And my lawyers are baffled and WikiLeaks is starting and people are like, why are they bugging us 40 employee cancer protection center when they're sidetracked with this other stuff? And I'm horrified to encounter these bureaucrats that really don't know what the hell they're talking about. And everything's very memorized. 
And I realized the problem with medicine and technology, the, the common burden is that we're being run by these people that have truly no experience. Like the FTC has like, you know, one expert that, that comes from another university for a year and they think that's enough background. It's, it's, it's terrifying if you're in it, but because it's divide and conquer and you're the only one in there alone, I guarantee you, nobody in the media or the tech world believes a CEO that's bitching and moaning as a one-off. You're just outnumbered. No one knows you. So, so the best thing I ever found, I'm going to read this. You don't have to read it, just listen to it. Because this is the best thing that summarizes the absurdity of what the, F, the power the FTC has. And we're never taught this, by the way. So the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission promulgates substantive rules of conduct. The commission then considers whether to authorize investigations into whether the commission's rules have been um, broken. The commission authorizes an investigation. The investigation is conducted by the commission, which reports its findings to the commission. If the commission thinks that the commission's findings warrant an enforcement action, the commission issues a complaint. The commission's complaint that a commission rule has been viol violated is then prosecuted by the commission and adjudicated by the commission. This commission adjudication can either take place before the full commission or before a semi-autonomous commission administrative law judge. If the commission chooses to adjudicate before an administrative law judge rather than before the commission, and the decision is adverse to the commission, the commission can appeal to the commission. If the commission ultimately finds a violation, then only then the affected private party can appeal to Article III court. But the agency decision, even before the bona fide Article III tribunal, possesses a very strong presumption of correctness of both matters of fact and law because the government is legally supposed to get the benefit of the doubt. That basically summarizes the unknown road I was walking from 2010 to 2018. <clears throat> and you can't get people to believe that. I wouldn't believe it. <laughs> a, so basically they're known to us guns because all they're doing is saving the world, but really they're threatening the hell out of you if you dare to push back. And so there's a gun to my head of, okay, Doherty, you better settle, and then you better sign a consent decree that says, in really fine print, you admit to nothing wrong. And of course, you know, everyone understands that when you're holding 700,000 cancer patients' diagnoses, and you agree to have the government come in and investigate you for 20 years at your expense, just to audit you for the next two decades, that you did it because you did nothing wrong. So it's kind of like, which way do you want to die? You want reputation to go down, or do you want us to just, you know, investigate you to death? And my lawyers are screaming at me like, you have, don't upset them. And I'm like, there is nothing that doesn't upset them if you don't go along completely. <laughs> they are appalled. Actually, they're not appalled. They're amused. Because big law and big companies go along to get along. And so they were just really thought, at the, early on they thought I was, you know, cute. Um, until I started making them crazy. And then my lawyers that I eventually hired that had government experience, because my lawyers in Atlanta didn't understand this operation and, and couldn't understand it. So they, they, I would be getting threats from people on my team like, you better sign, they're gonna bury you in procedures and data. So it's basically hell. But, but the short version of what they can choose to do to you is they can go to the Article Three court right away, where they can get handed their heads, like just happened to the uh, the air the, uh, the the no fly rule. To see that ruling this week, how the no fly rule sheet is unconstitutional as it's written right now, and that came out of an Article Three court, the Western District of Pennsylvania. But if they go to their administrative court, none of those other courts or any other government body can intervene until they're done with you. And then that's basically a marathon torture of hell. You know, uh, they drain you dry with time. They you, they don't consider the rules. They allow hearsay. Attorneys are privileged. They have attorneys that are investigating you and their investigations are privileged because they're attorneys. So there's no due process, there's no discovery rule. You can't be told what they have against you. So it's hard to fight against it. So they have one hundred percent of the time, your reputation is assassinated, because what Americans are taught this, right? So of course I'm guilty. Doubt kills, that's it, all I need is doubt. Psychological warfare then, cooperative press, damage operations, Chevron deference, which means Supreme Court doctrine that says that the government gets a benefit of the doubt. So that's what you're up against. <laughs> But I had no choice because I wasn't running Nordstrom or TJ Maxx or, you know, Target. I was in the unique spot that where this is a, either, either choice was a death now, and, and nothing was worse to me than thinking, I'm going to walk around all for the rest of my life going, I didn't do it. Everyone's going to go, yeah, he's saying he didn't do it again. Poor Mike, crazy. So um, I'm not sorry. 
But uh, it's all head on the spike. It's all, we were supposed to be the head on the spike to intimidate everybody into what not to do. And what not to do isn't, isn't relevant if it really happened or not. What's relevant is to build a list of what they don't want you to do so that you'll know what that is when your lawyer tells you based on what they said LabMD did wrong. Whether LabMD did it wrong or not is not important. This is what happens when Congress won't participate in anything. The agencies do this type of thing. There are absolutely no standards. Congress won't do anything. They don't want to. Because it's such a hot potato. They can't figure out technology to, know, to make it a political win. And they don't listen to you guys in the room. That's for sure. And so they don't know what to do, so they do nothing. And because it's so much of a hot potato. And so you have various agencies doing grabs for power. So if you're running a bank or in medicine, I had health and human services for everything, for years. Suddenly, here's the FTC. If I'm in banking, I've got the FDIC, I've got the SEC, I've got suddenly this. I mean, it's insanity. And it's such a few people that have this over-regulation that most people don't understand how it's dragging everything dead. And, and the whole game then is to exhaust your submission so you're out of resource before you get to a fair and impartial board. So luckily, I'm really good at fundraising. <laughs> so I basically got about $13 million of pro bono defense on this. So, because I was so pissed, if you couldn't tell. And so this is just a steamroll game. And I start investigating for myself, because I also learned investigators, lawyers are not investigators, right? And I can afford to have them. So I started investigating. I found out with this Tiversa thing that went on with us, Homeland Security was given $24 million for studies on peer-to-peer -peer file sharing leaks in the academic and healthcare setting. And what we found out was that that, that went to Dartmouth, and Dartmouth, the paper that came out mentioned LabMD in it, had our document in it that they took, d redacted and read when the patient information was, and that they're getting money off of this, and they're giving, Homeland Security is giving time, uh, Dartmouth, I'm sorry, Di Dartmouth is giving Tyversa all the credit, because they got their data versus Tyversa's software. And then they're chalked up, their, their board is chalked up with Tech Insiders, um, Howard Schmidt, Poneman, this is their, uh, their advisory board, and Wesley Clark. But Wesley Clark's out there with them um, in Congress uh, at hearings with Baubeck telling House Oversight and Commerce how dangerous this all is and how we're leaking everything the Pentagon backbone, all sorts of Army stuff, medical information. It's just bogus crap, but I didn't know it at the time, and I couldn't prove it. I was just trying to figure out how the hell this happened to us. How do we get snared into this? And then Tyversa put a press release out saying they did 300 million, 1.8 billion searches a day, 4.5 million workstations worldwide, 13.8 million files downloaded, they put, and they put the LabMD file up in front of House Oversight. This, I discovered this two years after it happens. It's kind of creepy, you know, what, what goes on. It's nothing but a shakedown. And they, if you ever read that, if you've watched the video, really, the 2007 um, uh, uh, hearings, it's incredible because everyone's just so much more gullible. You know, we never heard the word breach. We didn't know what things were. And the congressmen are like, this is an outrage. They don't realize that the thief is sitting right there in front of them. It's like, look what I stole. Um, you know, no one says it. Everyone's just like, oh, this is unbelievable. We have to do something. It's all about getting the company to break and sign that for consent decree. And I was the only one of all the companies I went after, to, after that fought it, because I was the only one that really had a death or death choice. Everyone else didn't survive. So the bottom line FTC game is get the consent decree, build a precedent, avoid the courts, mislead Stonewall Congress, play hero of the press. And who's going to believe me? Why would you? Years go by finally. So, so I'm like trying to get information. No one will tell me what we've done wrong or what should do right. We go to Sands, hire Ben Wright. This is an expert. He's the only guy I could ever see anywhere that criticized this whole method of enforcement by the FTC. By this time, we knew that uh, Bobak had taken the file through this study, and therefore he is Ben, who's a lawyer, is saying, "Well, this isn't a breach. This is not a legal breach at the point. This is the government agent coming in and taking something, and this file's not out of control." We know where it is, we know, we know where it's always been, it's never been out of control. This kind of you know, blew the minds. Now you start getting to endless wordsmithing games with little lawyers. And my lawyer that used to work at the FTC is like furious, I don't say furious, she's more, I don't know, sarcastic, threatening to me because I haven't um, 
because I'm not signing and I'm refusing to sign the consent degree, and she's telling me that, well, they're going to watch you for years to come. They'll always investigate you. They'll, that you will have them on your back forever. Well, but that's heartwarming. How much was that per hour? Thanks for being on my side. And so I'm like, why are they picking on me? Well, the more, more, more we learn is that it's easy to slaughter this. You know, I have $250,000 of insurance, $3 million of malpractice. Who thought this was ever going to happen, right? So it's persecution through process, okay? And the regular hierarchy really is there's this whole thing we don't understand that you have to go through that makes everyone buckle, pretty much, before you can get to someone that's got the power to rein in who's accusing you. And that is the gun to the head. Lawyers that are investigators with immunity, that's ridiculous. Consent decrees, which is just your quick way out, and your own lawyer's going to talk into doing this, because it's the cheaper thing to do. Administrative law judge, his hands are ultimately tied. You know, you've got the commissioners, and then you've got no congressional intervention until this is all done. Okay? Then you have the judge library at the Court of Appeals, which we won in the 11th Circuit. We could have easily lost it. But we had a judge, the lead judge, Judge Schoflat, actually is known to not even rely on his law clerks. This guy reads everything. And so he came in and just was, he's like, you'd be shocked how much they don't read. You just assume they're going to read your whole case. <laughs> <laughs> you are at the mercy of law clerks and their brain function and the quick Evelyn Wood speed reading skills of a judge. So by the time you get up there, you know, it's kind of like this whole, you know, who knows, it's like that game when they start in kindergarten purple and you end up over a toaster. That's kind of what can happen in a courtroom. So I knew I had the long slog, but I took it. I, mean, I already told you this, they went 100% of the time, but one of the commissioners did a study when he was commissioner of FTC, who, was a, who wanted to shed light on this racket, and he went and did data research and said in the past 20 years, FTC has ruled us in favor 100% of the time. So you get to go through this arduous, years-long, expensive thing to know it's just a farce. If you win, you're going to get overturned. And so you have to choose to know that you have to just walk through the whole fire, that there isn't any, there's only, one, there's only two choices. Don't start it or walk through it completely. There's no stopping in the middle. So we start going to court, and you can see the Article Three courts. We start fighting things to fight. Uh, cause of action starts paying for my defense, and their whole thing is to expose government bad behavior. So we start, they've got a lot of money, so they start filing motions to file motions to document these things in the record. Uh, and so the judge opens up saying, you know, you've never litigated your authority in this area to do this, although you've apparently done a lot of it. No one goes to court. You can't get to them. No one, no one waits that long unless you're crazy like me. He beats him up, he screams and yells, he still says he can't do anything about it. And we have to let them continue their investigation. Because I told them I wouldn't sign a consent degree. They said, we're suing you tomorrow. And they didn't sue us tomorrow. They just started a whole nother investigation to try to drag. So we started fighting back and forth. More steamroll, bullying. And because then the, the press broke it. So guess what the, the, my staff thinks, right? Okay, Mike. Did something wrong. Don't think Mike did something wrong. What do you do? How can he stubborn? God knows this guy's strong. Mouthy fight. Okay, so I don't know. I think we need another job. So they kill it from within, right? Because, you know, guilt, just doubt kills. Doubt kills. So I decide inside the system ain't going to work. I'm going to write a book. I wrote a book. Should have titled it The Fastest Way to Really Piss Off the Government. I love the fact they were mad. I can't tell you. The whole thing was built on the fact that. These people don't care about anything. They don't care about justice. They don't care about cybersecurity. They just care about you know, advancing their own agendas in their careers so that nothing will piss them off in that. That's what they care about. How great am I working here? I do such wonderful things for the unthankful public. So I thought, and this boy, it, it, it was a bullseye. <laughs> so they marched up to our, our first uh, status conference with 20 people from the FTC, and they told my lawyer, we're really upset about that book. He's like, well, I guess we just saved 20 free autograph copies. And so the biggest thing to do is just tell them, I'm not afraid of you. They are not used to that. And then what do they do? Then they come out pummeling, pummeling, pummeling. You know, because they're such wonderful people. And so, so they sue me. And a week later, Ty Versa sues me for defamation. What a coincidence. So quick. And the book's not even out yet. And so the FTC files a complaint against LabMD for failing to protect consumers' privacy. 
alleges exposure. Do you see the word breach there now? The same people that wrote that three years later, hmm, don't say breach. Exposure. Now this is nothing more than a fight. This is to teach me a lesson for daring to challenge their authority. And so it's now <clears throat> overturning the entire company, 40 depositions, scaring the bejeez out of everybody. <clears throat> Um, we go to that first court session where they, pump, they bring all their lawyers because now the ALJ, the, the hearing's going to start at the FTC and the guy says, what have you done to tell businesses what they're supposed to do? And this is what I put up in quotes because if I said this, who would believe me? They say, there's nothing out there for a company to look to. Now, I thought I was a normal person. So I thought I would say, well, there's no law and no specific specificity. Well, game, set, match over. Have a nice day, Lev, MD, we're done. No. We got to keep on going. This is 2019. Oh, they didn't tell us? Too bad for you. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so now everyone says out in pop culture, oh, it must be a HIPAA thing. LabMD did a HIPAA thing. There's something wrong. You guys did something. Because everybody knows we did something wrong. Trust me. There's no one out there that says LabMD did nothing wrong. The best I got was LabMD might have done something. I never got that. I just got guilt. So this was... Now, one of the bloggers, um, just who loves the FTC, just came at me big time. Never met her in my life. But to her benefit, I called her up and had a civil conversation. And she wrote a letter to help, uh, HHS. And, they, and, and she published their response. This is a response back from her. That's very few people that I've found, like, say something completely wrong about us and then correct themselves. So she and I are actually pretty good friends now. And they said they decided not to join the FTC in their investigation. We did nothing wrong. There was no obligation to notify anybody. So, there's, there's no proof of anything. No victims, no nothing. But the company closed, and this is where I learned by this point that Vilni wears many masks, none more dangerous than the mask of virtue. Because this whole thing of all these people that are trying to save the world, playing dirty, 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 with a cancer detection center. And I'm not getting any moral outrage from the media or Washington. Oh well. So, but I wrote that book. It's the best thing I ever did. I didn't tell a lot of people, because they'll tell you you're crazy. But I wrote that book, and I had an editor that just busted me around the head, so I didn't sound like a whack job in there. That was her job. And uh, it got people's attention. And I got Daryl Ice's attention. I got Congress's attention. Uh, didn't get much media attention. I was at 60 Minutes like four times. Too scary. Media is too scared. They don't want the, who am I? I'm Mr. Nothing. We're not going to burn our relations with the government for you, sir. We'll find another scary story that doesn't have some people that will tick off that can hurt us. And then another miracle happened. By the time the company's closed in January, we go through more depositions. We get a deposition of Eric Johnson from Dartmouth who says that they didn't get our file through that standard thing. They got that file from WebMD file when they asked for something. They sent an email, thank goodness for discovery, they sent an email saying, you know, this data sentence isn't quite what we're looking for. Do you have anything that could spice it up? And so they sent them the LabMD file. So the LabMD file came not the way uh, Dartmouth represented that they used the government's money for. And Rick Wallace calls me. He's the guy. I find out one night in April, like a movie. Calls me, upset, stressed out, saying, I ruined your company. It's worse than you know. I took your file. It was never on cyberspace. I came into your computer. I work for Bobek. I'm his number two. And we work with the FBI. We do child porn investigations for the FBI. And not only is what you wrote true, it's worse. So I'm freaked out. He's crying. His wife's on the phone. It's nuts. Two days of nuts. And tell the lawyers. And, you know, everyone. I learned in the rearview mirror that my lawyers didn't believe me. They don't believe you. They don't, they don't have to believe you to argue. So law is debate. It's not the seeking of the truth. It's not justice. It's not morality. It's argument of the law. And it's hard to separate that because they don't, they don't put that outside and say, hey, guess what? Welcome to court. This isn't about justice or truth. <laughs> they don't say that. <laughs> um, so I go in and, 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 and this is, and so he starts telling me, oh yeah, we're bringing the FBI. This is Rick getting his award the year before from Robert Mueller. So I'm like, you know, what happens when someone sends you pictures like this? You're like, this, I, all I wanted to do was like work over here by myself and like, you know, what's going on? 
So the FBI has their pants down, and you think naively, oh, I got them now. No. They, nothing phases these people. <laughs> Being caught. So we have to reverse engineer the whole thing. And we start learning more and more from FOIA and Rick and other things as this going on. And I'm, for the sake of time, just going to tear through the fact that we found out at this point that what happened was the FTC was sitting at that hearing in 2007 and later in 2009, learning about all this stuff, freaked out, they're responsible, they want Tyverse to cooperate with them and give them all those big bad companies. And Tyversa doesn't want to do it because Tyversa is working with the FBI and they don't want to be known as like this think, right? And so they set up a, a false company called the Privacy Institute in Delaware, Tyversa does. And then the FTC subpoenas that fake group so that no one can get all these files back. So they turn over about a hundred companies. Remember that prior press release? So this all comes from that. So these are taken, right? That's still another steamroller. And they also include, they didn't include this, but they took this, this was not in the 100, but this is where they also took, uh, they also found Barack Obama's helicopter plans. And they couldn't call Barack Obama and say, hey, we got your stuff, you want to pay us? So instead they monetized that by telling the press what happened. And it was, if you Google if you Google this, you'll see uh, a lot of big anchors, NBC guy, I can't remember his name right now, not Brian Williams, but anyway, doing a whole story on this, like, because he was only president for nine weeks at this point. It's all a complete lie. They found this in a workstation in Maryland, and they made up the IP addresses so no one could figure it out. But now they got on the wrong side, and all everyone's doing, it's, it's starting to be like things don't add up, but we don't embarrass ourselves because we were working with them as the government, so, you know, we'll just let this kind of fade away. And I'm the big pain in the butt that won't stop fading away. So, and I'm going to tear through this part to get to the end of this, but the courts basically, when we go to court, the rare times we get to court, they lose. But getting to court is nearly impossible. I'm telling you, the government has their hands around your ankles. You can't get to court. And so what he says then, you have no information to establish how evidence was obtained. Is that right? That's correct. The reason I put this up here is, if I could tell you without evidence in, in, in a transcript that they don't need any evidence to come at you, you'd think, well, you're just biased and you have an axe to grind. But this is what's in the transcript. You don't know where the evidence came from, you don't know how these people got possession of it, you don't know whether they originated from LabMD, but you're going to use that to show certain individuals were damaged? Yes, Your Honor. Holy cow. But they get away with it, because where's the media stories on this, right? Where, where is it? I mean, who's going to write? It's all kangaroo report stuff. So now we're closing that thing. Hang on a second. You don't plan to introduce evidence of harm? That's correct. Do you plan to introduce actual penetration of the network? No. No one ever do that. And then you have to understand, Congress has said that the agency can make the rules. The judge is semi-autonomous. He has to enforce their rules. Their rules are, you can't see the standards of cybersecurity that you're supposed to comply. Let me say that again. You can't see the standards for cybersecurity for which you're supposed to comply. So when we ask for those, the FTC argued, the court's order provides that LabMD may not discover the legal standards that FTC has used in the past and is currently using in four Section 5 cases. If I would have had that from quotes of a transcript, I guarantee you, you wouldn't believe me, I wouldn't believe me. Because what? <laughs> so it's just, it, you know, and even my lawyers are like, I don't know what world I'm in here. Because they're not, it's crazy. So finally we get, a year goes by, we're trying to get Rick the fifth, and he comes in, or he, I'm sorry, he comes in right away, pleads the fifth, the case gets stayed, everyone goes crazy, we want a meeting for him, we take him to, to, to Congress, Daryl Lice is all up in arms, because he was lied to at this hearing, it was his committees that were lied to. He gets what's going on, so he starts having investigations, they bring in hard drives, with the data to Congress, these people hop in on the other side. Senator Rockefeller hops in when he's not even in the House of Representatives. Elijah Cummings, the head guy. Susan Saxon Grimms is the head lawyer for the Oversight Committee on the Democratic side. You know how they, they kill everything? They won't look at the hard drives that have all this national security stuff on it. That's how they get to say they're not involved, they don't know. They don't want, I don't know. They don't say, I'm making sure I don't know. They just won't look. And they want everyone to go away. And they rode out the clock 
on ISIS term. So we couldn't get to any immunity for Rick. And investigative journalism, of, of the few journalists, too, <laughs> that were in the room for the full hearing in front of House Oversight, you know, you, you think you're going to have a House Oversight hearing and the full committee's going to be there, and you think you're going to be on C-SPAN and people are going to pay attention. It doesn't happen. And because they're kind of afraid of who they're going to tick off. And the other side does a proactive circle and confuse in the media. And these guys, these, these journalists can't follow technology, so they just go, I don't, I don't understand. And then they just move on. So nothing happened. And everyone was listening past the graveyard. Out of the blue, I still don't know why, the Justice Department gave the judge permission to award Rick immunity when Congress couldn't do it. So he gets immunity, he testifies, and that also results in ISA putting out this large report, which is on my website. If you want to read that report, it really is amazing. But what's amazing about it is what's in it, and what's amazing about it is no one's reported it. Is that Tyverse and the FTC had a, a quid pro quo relationship. The Tyverse would give the FTC companies to chase and prosecute. FTC would tell Tyversa information on companies that they were investigating. So that Tyverse would come and go, hey, well, you know, we know it's private, but they told us to be investigating. We have this tool you might want to buy. They might like it better. Millions of dollars in contracts. That's how they got paid to be a fan. And the court of closing arguments was, so I'm clear the government doesn't position as a breach is all that's required. Said, no, a breach is not required. So you can have your data and no breach, and you can still be breaking the law. I knew you guys all knew that. I'm sorry to repeat myself, right? They told you that at work, right? So anyway, all right. Moving right along. The FBI raids. I'm at RSA. Everyone's like, yippee -yo! We, uh, the, the, the FTC, um, I mean, the 11th Circuit overturns, they think we won, there's an, there's a, there's a uh, an investigation going on, we're stuck in appeals court, everything starts happening in slow motion now. Everything is really impactful, but it takes a year. Because the appeals process takes forever. But we didn't win. People, people, the media was getting kind of mad at me, because at the beginning I was really crabby, and I knew they would, they, then I learned they're not going to write about if you're crabby, because I'm like, what did we win? The company's gone, everyone lost their job. My company's destroyed, excuse me, what did we win? No apologies. Can't sue them, they all got immunity. Oh yeah, we won, sure. And then, uh, and, and, and this is, I'm sorry, what we won was the, the ALJ sent and put out a 93-page scathing opinion against the FTC. And the FTC overrules. And everyone was saying, they'll never overrule this. And they overruled it. So now we have to, so they jumped the shark. They just basically made up the rules by saying, intangible harm is a tangible harm. Because your anxiety of your data may be being out is a tangible harm. And really, this is what they do. They make these cockamamie crazy things, so the real thing that's going on is, I think we're gonna keep you in court a few more years, a few million dollars. That's what we're gonna do here. We're gonna see, we're on this marathon to see who dies before the finish line. And so, I'm happy because we're in Article Three court. Ropes and Gray comes in. Ropes and Gray is who took the Target case, the Sony case. So they do this whole pro bono defense now, because now my case is kind of big and sexy. And this is just one of the arguments, you just can see. Um, so the court says, does, to the FTC lawyer, doesn't that underscore the importance of a significance of rulemaking? Otherwise, you're regulating data on a case-by-case -case basis. We are regulating data security on a case-by-case -case basis. That's exactly what the Supreme Court says. And it doesn't matter whether the subject has any notice at all, that's correct. So notice is irrelevant. Correct. You can adopt new rules in adjudication. That means you get to make up the laws you go along after you've arrested the person. That's what that means. The Supreme Court made that very clear. And the judge laughed in their face. She thought, I appreciate your concessions. But the point is, those lawyers will argue that crazy stuff because 98% of the people will fall before you get to court like this. Every major company is going to listen to their lawyers and go, nah, we'll just fall. So even though I didn't fold and I won, they're not going to change, because everybody folds. So it's had impact, 11th Circuit, you know, now this is the language of the legal community. No one is paying any attention to the corruption that went on. They're all just writing about the legal impact. And so basically, FTC decision reigns in the FTC's authority to issue broadly worded and ill-defined orders. That's the bottom line. All that fight to the rest of the world is, now they can't just make stuff up. I didn't get a thank you note from anyone in the Fortune 500, by the way, even though this has saved them billions of dollars. But no thank you. But I didn't expect a thank you note. Okay, so now everyone goes, oh, you won, you won. Now you get to sue for millions and be rich forever, right? No, they have immunity. 
So the hundred years of these people have given themselves all sorts of immunity because, you know, they get to make mistakes, but if they get held accountable for their mistakes at destroying people, then no one's going to want to work for the government. <laughs> That's what they say all the time. <laughs> so this is the pie chart of all the litigation we have going on now trying to get accountability back. Because people think everything's over now and I just sit home and, you know, write my next book. Wrong. So <laughs> And so there's two tracks of things that we learned, and I'm going to sum this up to what's happened since, okay? There's two, basically, things that have helped, because courts have done nothing for us. Everything we've learned is through, through own investigations, um, the congressional investigation, FOIA, and putting things together. And that is the FOIA Act and this Mary Beth Buchanan. Okay. Rolling back to Rick Wallace. Mary Beth Buchanan turns out to have been the U.S. attorney at the time when Tyversa was working with the Pittsburgh FBI in 2000, the 2000s. Republican, Bush administration, um, really a pit bull, goes after her, and she wants to make child porn her thing. You can just Google the big profile of her in the New York Times, it had a full story on her. Child porn, here I am to save the world. So, that's fine. I hear about her in 2015 when Rick is torn through two law firms already. One of which was given $100,000 by the people that were defending me. And the guy tore through it in like six weeks and scammed. The other one just to go, you have to, you've got a, a, a client here who is terrified in so, all sorts of inner stress. And he's trying to do, make right of terrible things that he's done. And he can't get out of this, this thing that he has been sitting here changing these IP addresses and manipulating this data and, and participating in this scheme. And he's, he's only seen the carnage from what he did to a cancer detection center. So he is in this whole crazy beat himself up thing. So he's hard to handle for lawyers who are not therapists, by the way. And so it took a while. So he calls Mary Beth Buchanan because that's the only lawyer he knew that would understand and believe him. And we did not realize at the time, none of my lawyers knew, that that's a kind of a felony. When you're, when you were working in the executive branch and then later you come in the same case, that, that's a felony. But she did it. And we've later found out that, so, so, so at the time, during my hearing, um, she talked to one of my lawyers and talked them into the fact that Rick has his one shot at complete immunity when he goes on that stand. And he gets to have, he has to pour his heart out. And my lawyers don't really like Rick or don't get it. So she proposes that she be allowed, in my case, to do the cross or redirect on him to pull everything out. And she puts that in writing in her letter to the court asking herself to admit. And we allow her to do it because Rick was important to me. And I agree with her. And so what happens, she gets up there and she doesn't do it. And my lawyers go crazy. And so that, that's a short version of I ended up suing her and am suing her because we believe now she entered this whole thing to protect her convictions, the reputation of the FBI, the Justice Department, and just to keep Rick out of jail. In her mind, if Rick stayed out of jail, everything else he was fighting, oh well, and that included all LabMD's cases. That's the one area. And in the Freedom of Information Act, we, we found her meeting with the FTC six days before the testimony. Now, I don't know about FOIA, if you guys know much about FOIA, but you know FOIA is supposed to be the Freedom of Information Act, but there's a redaction party where they just you get all this stuff redacted. Well, what happens is, luckily, and this has never happened before, the FOIA came fast and like 10 pages redacted at the top were unredacted at the bottom. And it was a treasure trove of stuff. So we learned a lot about having proof. The second part is the big bomb that happened that we didn't really learn until two years ago. And this is sort of the close of this, but just, I need mean, five more minutes, man. Uh, I started late, remember? Um, okay, now I know. All right. Something never fit with this whole thing. But no one with technology experience got involved. And my lawyers early on didn't do any investigation. Hindsight's 2020, say what you want. Okay, so I had an attorney who said who actually researched all the patents and all the information about peer-to-peer -peer networks and how long it works. Um, and um, they researched all this and, and, he, and he said, this doesn't fit. 
you, LimeWire doesn't work like the FTC say it's working. It, it, it just, it can't find something. Our file was insurance, aging, bad, bad, bad. They couldn't have possibly gotten it that way. And so I called up Rick. Now, by this time, you know, I've seen Rick's house. He's flown my plane I'm here to Iowa. We have, you know, we, we have friendship. And uh, I said to him, okay, I'll, and by the way, when the, FTC, when the FTC overturned their judge, they said in their ruling, LabMD admitted using LimeWire-like software. Now, by this time, I know these are pathological liars, and if they've got LimeWire-like instead of LimeWire, something's up. And so I called him and I said, what do you use? He goes, well, we use this open source code. Now, he said, okay, is it LimeWire? Well, it acts like LimeWire. Okay, so if it's open source code and you think it's LimeWire, legally it's not LimeWire. So you didn't use LimeWire. So what did you do? Well, it was an investigation software from the FBI. <laughs> so now I call my other lawyer, I'll skip over this for time, but basically this, is, this created this World War III because evidently some of my attorneys in some other cases seemed to have known this and had, had what they thought was an obligation not to tell me. And we, um, we f when that lawsuit with Mary Beth Buchanan, that we sued her, accusing her of this type of, um, you know, um, we sued her for torturous interference and all sorts of violations. Basically, she just lied to me when she did this whole cross thing. And this whole thing's been a manipulation. And he was so mad because we didn't accuse him in the con in, in the, in the um, in, in the case, in, in the lawsuit. But Reuters wrote this big article about it. And the way they worded it, it sounded like they're kind of including him. So he's furious, and he's chewing me out, and he's sending me texts, get a life, you're mental, you're crazy, this is terrible. And then after, while he's ripping me a new one, he gives me Christmas in an email, and says, you stupid idiot, we used EP2P. Well, EP2P is software developed by the FDI, FBI to do child porn investigations. And we just had, and so now we know, aha. <laughs> aha. So it never was LimeWire. It never was publicly available. That's how they could have gotten it. And the FTC used FBI software that's used for FBI uh, investigations that's not publicly available. Wow. Anyone here shocked? So, <laughs> oh, you're shocked. I'm sorry. I was shocked too. It's a painful transition. So, so, this was from a Southern District of New York deposition just six weeks ago. So this is how long this has taken to scrape up here, okay? So this is, Mr. Walls, are you familiar with the term EP2P? Yes. What is your understanding of EP2P? It's an enhanced peer-to-peer -peer application. Is it commercially available? No. Where is it? Who developed it, to your knowledge? It was a collaborative a collaboration of law enforcement. How did you gain access to EP2P? If it, in your view, wasn't commercially available, it was going to be. By whom? The FBI. Who the FBI? Greg Frankhauser. Boom, boom, boom. So now we have it under oath. That took 11 years. So now where we're at is the power that was trying to steamroll us and got caught is now against us in court. And we're now, I mean, you know, we've had two lawsuits in Pennsylvania and New York. We're getting our butt completely kicked because the judges have not allowed us to bring in discovery. I mean, it's been amazing. But we have. A court cases against the government in D.C. We've got a case for um, uh, um, malicious prosecution in Virginia. And um, hopefully when I come back in a year, um, I'll be able to tell you about some wins. But that's the latest and the greatest. Thank you.